Hi and welcome back to Like Maria. Today I'm going to talk to you about another poem of the decade. It's going to be John Burnside's poem, History. So it's going to be really useful for Edexcel Pearson A-level students, but also for other people interested in poetry and particularly surrounding the events of 9-11 in 2001 um, and the Twin Towers. <laughs> So John Burnside has chosen to start off this poem with an epigraph. St Andrews, West Sands, September 2001. Straight away it puts us in mind of the events of that date. The tragic terrorist attack that caused so many deaths in New York City where a passenger plane flew into the Twin Towers. Now you should probably familiarise yourself with this if you don't know about it already, just from a point of general knowledge, but also particularly for this poem. It's not necessary to know detailed context, but a little bit of the flavour of the aftermath of that moment in time will be really useful. I'm going to point out three things in this poem that I think are really important, three areas that I'm going to ask you to springboard your analysis from. So number one is the narrative structure and particularly the time frame. Number two is the idea of the natural imagery and how that mingles with imagery of capitalism. And number three is the setting and the significance of the beach. OK, structure and time frame. I think this is a key element of the poem that it's crucial to understand in order to have a good appreciation of this poem. There is a mixed structure here between a free flowing description of a particular moment in time on the beach and then a more structured element of the poem where we're dealing with quite strict iambic pentameter. So round about line 22 when he says at times I think what makes us who we are, Burnside here is opting to discard the more fluid, broken, some might say fractured structure of the initial lines when he's talking about what's on the beach and he's thinking about the Air Force base into a much more philosophical, tightly structured section. At times I think what makes us who we are is neither kinship nor our given states, but something lost between the world we own and what we dream about behind the names. So there you can see, just after reading that out loud, that there is a rhythm and a structure and even on the page it looks quite structured. So we have the first section, today, today, I knelt down in the sand, reflecting on his actual surroundings, walking on the beach, putting himself in a physical situation and setting, describing things, and then a moment where he starts to ponder and become more philosophical about how people are going to approach the future and the sorts of thoughts that are going through their mind. Then he returns on days like this. Sometimes I am dizzy. So he has that tight structure, a philosophical moment, and then returns to the day like this. But there, I'd argue, after the day like this, that adverbial phrase of time, placing himself back again on the beach, he starts mingling these two ideas. And this is where we get the mingling of the imagery of the silken tides, um, the rose or petrol blue, perhaps referencing to the aircraft fuel, and the beautiful imagery that surrounds him on the beach. So the structure starts with the beach, goes into philosophical mode and then comes out again to reflect on the beach and then I would say ends back in philosophical mode. Patient, afraid, but still through everything, attentive to the irredeemable. But by the end of the poem he has lost that tight iambic pentameter. He doesn't return to that. It's as if something that he was certain of, that he was in control of, that he could confine in the verse has dissipated and he has lost that. So I think the structure here is really important. The child centres him. He talks about the child. I knelt on the beach. I knelt down, he says, in the sand with Lucas gathering shells. And it's as if all his attention goes into the child and then he's prompted, because he's looking at the child, to think about the future. 
and to think about what may be coming at times, I think. So this is a poem structured around the way Burnside's thoughts are moving from a physical situation into a philosophical situation. OK, next thing I want to talk about is the natural imagery and how it is mixed um, with other imagery. At the beginning, or on the first page here, we have his child gathering shells, finding evidence of life in all this drift work. Fair enough, we're looking at little creatures maybe on the beach and starfish and things. And then he talks about snail shells, shreds of razorfish, smudges of weeds and flesh on tired, worn stone. And here I think Burnside is beginning to mingle the imagery of the aftermath of 9-11. You can almost imagine firemen sifting through the debris that is created by the collapse of the Twin Towers and finding smudges of weed, smudges of flesh and razorfish. There's something very um, aggressive about the razorfish, the cutting edge of that mention of razor. And I think here we've got the sibilance of the snail shells and shreds, but the harshness of the razorfish um, there, which is just a hint of the idea that nature is here on the beach, but it's being tainted by danger. Now, I think if you turn over the page, you get a very much more obvious suggestion of this. We have these, the sea, the sky, all living creatures, forests, estuaries. We trade so much to know the virtual. We scarcely register the drift and tug of other bodies. So here I would say he's mixing the imagery of capitalism with its cash registers um, and its trade into that natural imagery of the sea and the sky and the living creatures. And he's talking about the drift and tug of other bodies. So there is a sense here that we are being pulled in different directions, um, that the natural world is somehow being corrupted by the capitalist cash registers and the trading. Notice that word there, the trade, the Twin Towers were the World Trade Centre. So he's bringing our mind back to perhaps thinking about what the Trade Centre was an emblem of, and then it was indeed an emblem of success of capitalism. And he's putting that image, mixing it with the um, sea and the sky and all living creatures. And he is remarking that he's dizzy with the fear of losing everything, that the pushing for trade and success and money somehow takes our mind away and our presence away from knowing and understanding the natural world. This, of course, is one of the great arguments and debates and problems with 21st century society. He ends the poem thinking about how to live and do no harm. This is his key question. And so here he is clearly pointing us towards ideas of sustainability and how we might live and do no harm, how we might pick up the pieces even from 9-11 and move forward without doing any harm. So he's addressing these issues here and referring us to the debate about how we should live and the idea about creating money and how creating money can harm nature. I think here we also have the um, toddler on the beach involved in this imagery. The toddler on the beach is sifting wood and dried weed from the sand at the very end of the poem. Um, he seems to have kind of returned to this innocent ability to sift through and Burnside can describe him um, as doing that, as being puzzled by a pattern on a shell. He's um, quite comfortable there on the sand, a picture of innocence. And perhaps this is Burnside's um, suggestion of a hopeful future, rather than the razorfish and the smudges of flesh from earlier on in the poem. So perhaps there is a glimmer of hope there. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about today is the significance of the beach. And I think it's really key here that Burnside has chosen this liminal space, this space that can be a transition between solid ground and the sea, 
but also a space that incorporates the sky. So in a sense here, we have the whole of the world and the whole of creation involved in this setting, the sand, the solid ground, the sky and the water. And here there is imagery that suggests that the water and the sky are unpredictable. They are natural. Um, the kite is on a line raised in the winds. Our bodies are fixed and anchored to the shore. And there is a suggestion here that we think that we are anchored to the shore and we are perhaps in control and our lines are raised, but the winds and the sky um, can control those. And also that the sea, um, by nature of its um, distant shapes that we find in the water, um, of its silt and tides, um, can, um, it can be unpredictable. And there is also a sense here that the tide will come in and come out and continue um, to do so and that we don't have any control of that. So I see here a sense of the human being buffeted by the elements. Um, we are hopefully fixed and anchored. We like to think we are, but perhaps we are not as fixed and anchored um, as we like to think. And indeed, I think this is a reflection from both sides on how the future is very much not fixed and anchored um, for us. Um, that the reaching to the sky with the kite brings imagery of reaching to the sky, perhaps with the skyscrapers. We are in a precarious situation and we therefore expose ourselves um, if we do not try to live without doing any harm and that we should gaze upon the cherished world and be aware of, he says, um, our cherished world instead of doing things that could lead to damaging it. So that's some ideas. I hope you've enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time for some more poems of the decade.